Titus chapter 2. Turn there if you would in your Bibles, Titus chapter 2. We get to uh, finish out our, our series in uh, this, this Christmas season, you know, always looking for different ways we can approach understanding Christmas so that it, it doesn't lose its impact or its luster. We've uh, spent five weeks, this is the fifth week, uh, talking about the sun. First week was a sun promised. The Old Testament pointed you to the coming of Jesus. Second week was a sun sent. Galatians 4 4, it's just the perfect time God sends his son into the world. Uh, week three was a son condemned. Why did Jesus come? He came to die and to take upon himself our sins. Believe it or not, uh, in Christ there is freedom because he takes our sins and yet gives us his righteousness. Hello, Merry Christmas. That is not, is that not the best gift ever? Uh, and then we looked last week at a son reigns. Uh, Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, even right now reigning, and then uh, that reign, while it may be invisible at this moment, it's, it's actually manifesting itself in the hearts of his people, but one day it will become very visible, where that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Some will do it willingly, I hope you're in that part, uh, but some will be forced to do it, uh, because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And today we get to talk about a son return. So uh, we're going to be looking at Titus, so that uh, slide right there, we looked at that last week, but it's a son returns. Because he's coming back, just like he said he would. There was a song by Reverend Al Green uh, that some of you do not know. There's a generation that knows not Al Green, and I'm a, I'm a little bit dismayed about this. Uh, you know the song, don't you, Marsha? Okay, there you go. So if Marsha gives it a thumbs up, that's a high endorsement, all right? So put on your New Year's Eve playlist. The Reverend Al Green, he's coming back just like he said he would. When was the last time you thought about the return of Christ? It's been a long time, hasn't it, for some of you. Some of you are like, wait, he's coming back? He is. Oh, well, I hope it's every day. So um, I was thinking about awkwardness uh, the other day. You, you ever had any awkward moments in your life, anybody? How many of you have awkward moments on a daily basis? Just raise your hand. So there was a, there was a, I had an awkward moment last Sunday uh, during service, right? I thought it was my turn to come up on stage and, and preach the message. And my wife goes, um, we have one more song. And I silently just kind of slick back to my chair. And uh, it was a little awkward. Usually I don't get the timing wrong. But when it happens, it's, uh, it's usually in public and it's, it's somewhat humiliating. Um, there was a poll done recently of top five awkward moments. People kind of collected this data. I think it was BuzzFeed, and they said, top five awkward moments. And I bet you probably couldn't guess what they are, but I think we've all experienced each of these awkward moments to some degree. Number five, awkward moment. Coming in at 45% of people agreeing when you go to a party and someone's wearing the same clothes you are. <laughs> awkward, you know? People, I usually don't get that because I, I wear such cool patterned shirts, right? So... Some of you were a little caught off guard last week when I didn't have a pattern shirt. They're like, who are you and where is our pastor, right? How about awkward moment number four, 53%, saying goodbye and then leaving in the same direction that the person you just said goodbye to. You ever been there? You hate that. 53%, Julianne's in that crowd right there. Coming in at number three, 66% awkward, the person who traps you for a chat that you don't want to have. You ever been there? Like, okay, this is not where I want to be. Number two, 86% awkward, attempting a handshake, hug, or kiss, and having the other person choose something different than what you're going in for. It's like, oh, you know, 86%. Number one, according to the poll, taken 97% awkward, having to introduce someone when you can't remember their name. Anyone? This just happened Christmas Eve with my neighbor who I've known for years. I go, oh, this is Marie, and it's Maria, and she goes, uh, it's Maria, and I'm like, ah! so the next day, I had to make sure, I was like outside, looking out, making sure when Maria left the house, I could go say, hey, sorry about that last night, I got her name wrong, she's like, it's okay, she's such a forgiving person, anyone been there, forgot someone's name, how about your own children, you ever forget their names, happens all the time, now as awkward as those situations and those scenarios may be, I would like to just offer perhaps the most awkward coming in at 100%. And it's this, Jesus coming back and us not being ready. 100% awkward. And not only is it awkward for those who don't know Jesus, because here's what we do know, he's coming back. And he, he is patient, and he is long-suffering, and he's giving people this opportunity to come and know him. And if you don't know him, before he returns, it will be too late. 
awkward, to say the least. But perhaps even awkward for us as believers, because of all the people who should be watchful and vigilant and alert and aware, it ought to be us, but yet how many of us have been remiss in remembering he's coming back, just like he said he would? Can I just tell you right now, I want to I save you from, from that moment of awkwardness. I want to save you from that moment of embarrassment. The Bible says, I don't want you to be ashamed at his arrival. I want you to be ready and eager and, and excited and anticipatory of, of him coming back. I mean, let's be real. It could happen today, and I hope it does. I, I, I was watching the game last night, Cowboys-Lions. Come on, it fared pretty well for a Cowboys fan like me. Uh, my neighbor came over the other day, who I rarely talk to. This is someone behind our house, and I was wearing my Cowboys uh, hoodie, and he's like, you're a minister, aren't you? And I said, yeah. He goes, how, about, how, how come you're a Cowboys fan? I said, I'm a man of deep faith, my friend, deep faith. He goes, touche, touche. So I'm watching the game last night thinking that the Cowboys, they're losing this thing. And you would have thought, if you didn't watch the game, it was a whole debacle at the end of the, end of the game. Cowboys snuck out with a victory, a pretty controversial victory. Well, the quarterback for the Lions was interviewed after the game, um, Jared Goff, who's had quite a number of seasons in the NFL. He said something really interesting because you would have thought that the, the, the Lions won this game at the end. There's celebration. There's guys lifting each other up. There's head bumps and chest bumps and all that stuff. And then only to have uh, the two-point conversion call back. There was a penalty and an ultimate man on the field, et cetera, et cetera. So Jerry Goff, Goff in this interview said this, it's unfortunate, man. I don't know if I've had this feeling before where you feel like you won and then you didn't. And I think those words are really haunting, right? Like everyone's doing the victory dance and then to know like, nope, you didn't win. And it's like, really? And I think what Goff talks about pertaining to a game can be pulled back in a greater scope and understanding of how many of our lives are lived with no sense of eternity, where we think we're winning. I think a lot of us are going through life and we think we're winning, when in the end we're going to meet God face to face and we're going to realize we haven't won, but we've lost. Because we've loved things other than him. We've wanted things other than him. And, and I want us to be prepared. I guess that's part of my role today. As we finish out 2023, and Lord willing, we have 2024. There's no guarantees you're going to be here tomorrow. He could come back today. Amen? Uh, see, we got to remember that, right? Um, I want to prepare you for the best year ever. I want to prepare you for the best year ever. And, and, and maybe return is the word of the year. You know, people claim words of the year, and they're like, I just want to have the word belief this year. You know, I want to have the word joy this year. Maybe it's return this year. Maybe it's return. Maybe it's return in the sense that Christ could come back at any moment. And the question is, are you ready? Because I don't want you to win in this life and miss out losing on the life that's yet to come. And I think the Bible is really, really clear. Did you know in the scripture that there are 318 references to Jesus' second coming just in the New Testament? Which means one out of every 13 verses speaks to the second coming of Christ. That's a huge number. Every letter book of the New Testament, 27 of them, uh, every one of them except for four mentions the second coming of Christ. And the second coming of Jesus is mentioned in connection with moral, godly living now. Meaning, there is an event that's about ready to take place. How does that event that's yet to take place affect how you're living now for his glory and the world's good? So there's this moral imperative that's tied up with the return of Christ that we really need to seriously consider. Now, I know some of you are asking, well, when is he going to come back? Wouldn't we like to know that? How many of you have always wanted to know, well, when's he returning? Well, here's two things I know to be true. Number one, we don't know. And number two, because we don't know, we should always be ready. And this is what the New Testament teaches. Because here's what you need to realize is that we are living in the last days. Some of you are like, well, what's the end times? When's this going to happen? When's that going to happen? Too many people are so fixated on some sort of chronology of, of the last days, they forget about the fact that the book of Hebrews says Jesus' first arrival 2,000 years ago started the last days. We are living in the last days right now. The next event to happen is him coming back. So the question is, while we don't know the day or the hour, we're to be vigilant and be ready, and not be surprised when it happens, because it's going to happen. 
And so my question to you is how do I, as your pastor, prepare us? Because there's two extremes I want to avoid. I want to avoid the extreme of insanity over here, and I want to avoid the extreme of indifference over here. You know the insanity group. These are the people that are writing books about we have figured out the date he's coming back. And you know how many books that have been written about we have found the date that he's coming back and have been wrong? They now fill the bookshelves of your local Goodwill and library because they haven't. They sold a bunch before the date happened, and then when the date arrived and didn't it didn't happen, they they end up in the discount bin. Or people sell everything they have, all their possessions, and they go and they buy a toga and some sandals and go live on a hillside with a big sign saying, "Jesus, here I am. I'm ready to go." And they live out their days waiting for Jesus of being no present good. There's this insanity group that I don't want you to be a part of. We're we're to recognize he's coming back, but we're also to understand that there's work to be done until he does. Which then we also need to avoid the opposite, and that's indifference. See, the fact that I had mentioned the return of Christ, some of you are like going, number one, wait, he's coming back? You don't even know. Some of you are like, I haven't even thought about that in a long time. There's the problem. This is something that the New Testament puts such weightiness on that we are to be thinking about it every single day. That our hearts don't grow complacent, apathetic, cold, lethargic. That our hearts would just be invigorated every single day and think today could be the day. Today could be the day. And I think when we think about this, it's going, to, it's going to encourage us to live a certain way, which we're going to talk about here at, at the end. So let us not embrace insanity. Let us not embrace indifference. Let's embrace a sensitivity that, hey, right now, today, we have work to do. Today's the day of salvation. He could come back today, and if not, we hope it's tomorrow. Amen? Because here's what Jesus told his disciples on John 14, just as he was announcing kind of the, 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 the chronology of events that's about to happen in his life, and they grew a little bit hopeless and dismayed. He comes along and says in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Here's something I know is that there's several people in this room right here at this moment whose hearts are troubled. You're troubled by something. You're troubled by a health issue. You're troubled by a relationship issue. You're troubled with, with something going on in your life. And here's what Jesus does. He promises you when you believe in him, you can have some sort of assurance and certainty. And I think this is what you can only find in God, is, is not this hope so, but a hope sure. Write that phrase down. That's a good, that's a good phrase. Right? I won't charge you extra for that one. Hope sure. See, outside of Christianity, all the world has is hope so. I hope my guy gets elected. I hope my NFL team goes to the Super Bowl. I hope, I hope, I hope so, but there's no guarantees. There's only one guarantee in life, and that's all the promises that are found in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And as sure as he was crucified, buried, and rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, and as the disciples are watching in the beginning of Acts, the angel says, hey, guys, what are you looking at? He's going to come back just the same way he, di- he disappeared. So get busy and work. <laughs> Right? But let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, do not know that I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Is that awesome? It's like the, the disciples, he can just see this quizzical look about them. Like they're just kind of like, wait, we don't know what you're talking about, right? And he's just like, hey, just so you know, I'm going to leave. And I don't want you to be hopeless, and I don't want you to be despondent, and I don't want you to be frustrated, I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to know I'm going to come back. I'm going to prepare a place, and, and I'm going to bring you home one day. So how do we prepare? How do we prepare for our eternal home? How do we anticipate the second coming of Jesus? What, what does it mean for the son to return? Uh, there's four things, three things I want to, four, no, three, uh, I want to focus on this morning. There's a hope that begins in us, there's a hope that builds in us, and there's a hope that's blessed in us. Those are the three points, and we're going to look at Titus chapter 2. So turn there in your Bibles, if you would. We're just going to look at a few verses in Titus. Titus is a really cool letter. Who's Titus? Glad you asked. He's a pastor on this island called Crete. Paul was his mentor. Paul, uh, when he was released from Roman prison, and then he ultimately went back to Roman prison, and then ultimately was beheaded under Caesar Nero, uh, he had this ministry and wrote letters uh, to Timothy and Titus. That's what we have in the Bibles, in our Bibles. Uh, First Timothy, uh, First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. We call them the pastoral epistles. 
This is Paul's writing to these young pastors and how to best lead their churches. Timothy was in Ephesus. Titus is on the island of Crete. Titus wants to lead his people well. He's a young pastor who desires good things. And so he understands that by teaching the truth and encouraging people in godliness is the best way to live. I would say, here, here, I'm right there with you, buddy. So Paul's instructing Titus. And if you look at the book of Titus, starting at verse um, 1 in Titus chapter 2, he's talking about the many people that occupy the church. He says in verse 2, they're the older men in the church. Here's how you're to lead them. Verse 3, there's the older women. Here's how you're to lead them. And then he says in verse 4, there's their young women in the church. Uh, and then in verse 6, the young men. So he's speaking to everybody, right? Young, old, it doesn't matter. Here's what I love. A church that's not bifurcated. A church that is not, you know, lives in compartments or, or categorized, right? Here we are in this room. There's young, there's old, there's men, there's women. Isn't this great? This is the mosaic of God's people, right? The most segregated time in America is Sunday mornings. That's what I think the Reverend uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said the most segregated time in America is Sunday mornings during, at, at 1030, right? We all separate in our own churches, in our own little Bible studies, in our own groups, and rarely do we see the, the homogeneity that we see like this. Amen to the mosaic of God's people. Amen? Aren't, there glad, aren't you glad there's young and old here? And we know Gunther's the oldest, so uh, in dog years, I mean that in all love. So, um, so he says in verse 9, so check this out. So go to verse 10. So he's instructing all these different groups, and he says in verse 10, uh, right, don't pilfer, but show all good faith that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. So I love that word adorn, meaning whatever you do, whether it be the older men, older women, young men, older young women, make sure they conduct themselves, live their lives where they're adorning the gospel. They're making it attractive. What a cool thing, right, for, for any pastor to say, when you leave here today, my prayer is that you would go out into the world and somehow in your life, in your behavior, in your conduct, you would make the gospel of Jesus attractive. Then he says in verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Ladies and gentlemen, Christmas, the incarnation, the grace of God is Jesus. Grace is a person. He exhibits, he is grace. He exhibits grace. He shows grace. You want to see what grace looks like? You look at Jesus. And when you taste and see how good Jesus is, you become an agent of grace yourself. So grace of God has appeared, Christmas, incarnation, bringing salvation to all men. All who come to me will find rest. This is what Jesus promised, right? Uh, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but he came into the world to save, save the world, right? So he comes and he brings people to himself. He's still doing that today, Amen. And then he says in verse 12, instructing us, so here's now our present responsibility, we are being taught, what, to do two things, negative and a positive. The negative is to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and then positively to embrace and live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's discipleship right there, right? Renounce ungodliness and worldly desires and embrace righteousness and godly living. Why? Verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why are we instructed to live this way? He's coming back, just like he said he would. Who gave himself for us, verse 14, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. These things speak and exhort Reprove with all authority and let no one disregard you. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Three things, as promised. First one, hope begun. God's gift of grace founded in Jesus Christ. So hope begun. You cannot know hope unless you know God. Here's the hope so versus the hope sure. Right? People try to find hope in a lot of things. Politics. Religion, sports, sex, education, career, right? We go into these things, and, and there's nothing wrong, inherently evil, with any of those things. But when you put all your trust in them, and they fail you, because I will tell you, they will, it doesn't breed certainty and assurance in our hearts. Nor were they meant to. 
God is a God who wants to breathe assurance and certainty in your hearts, but he's not going to do it apart from Jesus Christ. We need to realize hope begins when you know God's gift, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Back to verse 11, right? The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. So God mercifully sends his son, not as a warrior king, but as a humble king. Is this amazing? We've talked about this over the past couple weeks, that Christ came to save sinners and not to slaughter them, which he could have done. How many praise God for a God who's not slaughtering us today, but saving us today? Woo! Merry Christmas, right? Like, he is a God who says, I have come to save you, not slaughter you, but do not be mistaken. At my second coming, Christ is going to establish and execute true justice. So in the meantime... We are to live as those who are redeemed. He came to deliver us from the penalty of sin. Write that word penalty down because we're going to come back to this. And I want you at the end to understand the stages of your salvation, which are three stages. The the greatest being you are declared not guilty because of what Jesus has done in in your place. How many of you wanted to say hallelujah right now? See, he has come to do away with religion. He's come to do away with all your good works because we try to earn our way to God and there's no way to do it, right? All of your good works are nothing but filthy rags. That's what Isaiah says. That's why we need a substitute. That's why we need a redeemer. God makes him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that whoever believes in him, you're not going to perish, but you're going to have eternal life. Hallelujah. What a savior. This gives us hope. And as sure as Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again on the third day, your hope is not a hope so, your hope is a hope sure. And he's coming back just like he ascended. In the same manner, he is coming back. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a glorious king who has ascended to heaven's throne. Amen? We have a merciful priest who is helping us in our time of need. Amen? And we have a coming champion who will enact true justice and end all wars. Wow. But what God has done in us, he's continuing to do through us as we minister to a world that is hopeless and lost. See, I think so many of us come to know Jesus, and once we know Jesus, once we're saved, we kind of throw things in kind of autopilot or cruise control and think that there's no work to be done. Can I just tell you, once Christ has done the work of saving us, rescuing us from the penalty of sin, there's incredible work to be done. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. This is why I was thinking about this this, this second point, right? Hope building, that we are fueled by God's grace, and there's, there's several things that are, are a part of this, but I, I heard an interesting story this week. Um, so Notre Dame Cathedral burned down 2019, four years ago. It seems like it was just yesterday. And they've been in the, the process of rebuilding this, this historic cathedral. Well, this past week, they held their first concert there. And they brought in the Notre Dame choir. And I want to show you a picture of the choir because I don't think you've ever seen a choir dress quite like this. So, Debbie, we have the picture. So here's the choir. So you'll notice that they're wearing construction outfits and hard hats. Why? Because the work of the cathedral is still ongoing. It's still a a dangerous sight. But they felt it was, it, was, it was safe enough to bring this group in who are usually adorned with, with robes. But even though the attire may look different, the voices still brought that transcendent ministry that choirs often do. You think about it. They come in. If you, if you want to Google it later and watch on YouTube, they have video of these angelic voices transporting us from this earthly realm and taking us to someplace else. That's what choirs do, right? Like choirs remind us that this world is not all there is, that there's something beyond us. And you hear their voices, you hear the men, the women, the harmonies, you hear some instrumentation, and all of a sudden this, this place that, is, that has been burned, this place that is still under construction, this place that is, is, is being rebuilt, it, it, it's still being used, Right? And these, these men and women come into this dangerous location and they don workers' outfits and hard hats. Why? Because they realize that the work is continuing, but in the meantime, people need encouragement. And so just like this choir who comes into this beautiful space, this sacred space that is, that is under construction, they have a responsibility to transport us to, a, to another place. They're ready to work. 
They're prepared to work. And I'm thinking to myself, how many of us need to look like this in our world, right? We exist to help people think about the other world. We, we exist to help bring this spirit of, of worship and adoration to people who are feeling discouraged and depressed, right? The idea that you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, what, for good works and to do good works, right? Does, doesn't Titus, uh, isn't he encouraged by Paul at the very end of verse 14, say, be zealous for good works. So ladies and gentlemen, there is work to be done. God saves you. Not so that you can alone rest in your assurance and security, but that you can now be an agent of his work to let other people know there's a God who loves them, who wants relationship with them. So are you ready with your hard hats and your workers' outfits, right? You ready with your angelic voices? Let's hear a little bit. No, let's not. Let's, let's just pretend, right? Here it is. Hope building. Point number two. So he says in, in verse 12, check this out. He says that we are instructing others to deny God, uh, ungodliness and to deny worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So hope begins in us. God frees us from the penalty of sin. You wrote that word down. Now we are building on that hope as we walk with Christ because this is what a walk with God does. It enlarges our hope. If you're feeling hopeless as a believer, you have cut off connection with your God. Let me say it another way. The more you draw near to your God through Jesus Christ, your Redeemer, your hope will grow. Your lack of connection with God will diminish hope. So now what we have to do in order to, to fight for, because you have to fight for this. It requires a negative, denouncing, worldliness, godly, ungodliness, worldly desires, and embracing a life of holiness and godliness. And God now saves us with the power, write that word down, power to do this. One time event, you're freed from the penalty of sin. This is what Jesus has done for you. Once you accept that, you are declared not guilty. Woohoo! But now the course of your life is now being free, given the power to live a righteous life. Now, here's what I want you to be careful of, and I want you to be cautious of. Right belief about this will lead to right behaviors. See, a right affection for God will lead to right actions for God. We tend to, and especially in our culture, this is why I have to preach on this, we get it backwards and we always look to our behavior and our actions first. And I'm going to tell you right now, God does not want you to believe in some sort of behavior modification theology. He doesn't want your behavior to change without first your heart being changed. True actions for God should stem from true affections for God. Can I get an amen from somebody? God does not want religious people. The world is filled with religious people who are doing good works, but they're not doing it for the right reasons. We don't work for God's approval. We've already been approved in Christ. We work because we have been approved in Christ. Therefore, it makes my motivation not for him to make, me, make him like me more. He already loves me crazily. But because of what he's done, my response to his love for me is one where I want to please him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Are we clear on this? Because I would set you up for failure if we were primarily focused at your behavior and your actions and we weren't addressing first your belief and your affections. Hope is built when you trust the promises of your God. Hope is certain when you take God at his word. Assurance comes when you, by faith, with the work of his word and the power of the Holy Spirit, bringing to completion this work that he's promised to never give up on in your life. Whoa. You guys. It's grace that not only redeems us, point number one, 
But now hope is building. It's grace that reforms us. So what we think about God is going to greatly determine my behavior today. What, what I believe about him returning is going to impact what I choose to do and how I choose to love today. Here's, here's what I want you to consider. There's a phrase, and, and, I, and I like this phrase, but not necessarily in a good way, that there are some Christians that are so future-minded, they're of no present good. I don't want you in that category, right? That we're so, ta- we're so fixated talking about the end times, and when's Jesus coming back, and we get together in our Bible studies, and we've got our chronologies out and our charts out, and we're like all excited but we're of no good today loving people with the love of Christ, showing grace that Jesus showed people, to show forgiveness to people that Jesus showed us, right? This is what the world needs. They don't want to see your chronological timeline of end times. They want to see how gracious and loving and forgiving you are. This is where hope is built, right? When men and women are fueled by God's grace. Of course, C.S. Lewis, you ever heard of him? His book, Mere Christianity, the the number one book that transformed the 20th century Christian mind more than any other book. And if you have a book list, so maybe for some of you that have resolutions, add this to your to-read list. Mere Christianity, Outside the Bible, is the book that has most transformed Christian thinking globally in the 20th century, and I'm going to tell you into the 21st century. Lewis wrote this 70 years ago. Look what he says. Hope is one of those theological virtues This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, and I love this, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. Wow. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. So here's what Lewis says, as masterfully as he always does. As we consider Christ returning we ought to be the ones who are most faithful to what God wants us to do today in showing the world a love, a forgiveness, a grace that it has never experienced before. How, how do we do this? There's three things I want to give you. I want you to think about based out of this passage here. Number one, grace grips us to renounce. As a believer, We are continually learning how to renounce ungodliness and worldly desires. I don't know about you, but I'm not the same person I was a year ago. And praise God for that. Why? Because only by God's grace have I learned to love Jesus more and loosen my affections on anything else I thought would love me like that. Right? The the world is alluring. It is enticing. It promises you things that it can never deliver on. And some of us have bought into the lie, and some of us have felt the sting of buying into that lie. I'm going to tell you right now, there is no small T treasure that will ever compete with the affections of the true treasure, Christ Jesus himself. And here's what we need to understand. When Paul says to Titus, instruct them to deny renounce ungodliness and worldly desires, we need to realize that without God's truth, we will never understand what a path to godliness looks like. That, d- that belief does impact our behavior and that our, our journey with Christ is one of continual denouncing of things that hinder us from growing in holiness. Can I tell you, I know something true of every single person in this room, including myself. There's something right now today that's competing with my allegiance for Christ. And God says, renounce it. Get rid of it. Sever it. You know the language Jesus uses? If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Now, some of you are like, is he, is he being serious? Like, I'm, next Sunday, we're going to come to church, and all of us are going to be like, yep, had a bloody week. <laughs> I popped out and all that. Like, no, don't, don't take it literally. 
If your right hand causes you to sin, what does he say? Cut it off. The teachings of Christ are pretty severe. But what is he saying? He's saying, as severe as my language is, so severe should your attention be when it comes to renouncing sin in your life. Because the issue no longer is I can't. The issue now as a Christian is that you won't. Because if you're saved in Christ, he has given you the power to walk in holiness and godliness. And so gouging eyes and cutting off hands is nothing compared to having a heart that is free to adore and love your God. See, the Christian life should look different week to week, month to month, year to year. How? You should be growing in your affections for Christ. How's that looking in your life? Because here's what I don't want you to leave. I don't want you to leave with a sense of false security like, I'm in. I haven't changed in 10 years, but I'm in. Eh, Don't be so quick. Examine yourselves. The Bible says examine yourselves and see where you're at. Have you grown more affectionate for Christ? Have you you done battle with those things that are competing with your heart? And we all face it. Every single day we wake up and things are rushing at us and they're saying, love me, want me, choose me. And then there's Jesus who oftentimes is not the one shouting, but has that still small voice that's waiting for you to slow down and say, love me, want me, desire me. See, there's a, there's, a, there's a dullness that happens. I don't want your hearts to be dull. I want your hearts to be delighted. Are you more excited about Christ than you were a year ago? Man, as you think about this year, how does your life adorn him? Isn't that the language he uses in verse 10? How have you grown in your affections, right? All I know is my house, we have a hard time growing things like plants and bushes and trees. Anyone else have this problem? I'm, a, I'm good at killing plants, trees, and bushes. Like, I go to Home Depot, I have the best of intentions, and I buy all their crap that they tell me, oh, yeah, this is going to be fail-proof. And before you know it, things are dying. Here's what I do know. Like, the, the c- continual upkeep to, to maintain something beautiful, there's a lot of work that need. But if I choose not to address it, you know how easily weeds grow? How many of you have just weeds that are just growing like crazy in your house? No judgment, sinners. But i uh, just kidding. All I know is if you leave your garden unattended, weeds will grow like crazy. They don't need help. And all of a sudden, you got to go out there with that weed killer, right? Roundup or whatever it is, and you and you just you just douse. I'm dousing dousing the dog and kids with round. I'm like, I've got every. No, I'm not doing that. I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, he's really cruel towards his family, right? Here's what I do know: you don't. If you don't want to tend to your garden, let the weeds grow. But if you want to cultivate a beautiful garden, it requires work. How much, soul, how much for your soul? How much work is needed to cultivate the garden of your heart? It is, it is this that is the fountain of your life, the wellspring for which everything is, is, is deriving life and hope and joy from. Are you safeguarding your hearts in Christ Jesus? Grace is not a license to do what we please. It is the power to do as we should. This is what God has done for us. This is not me trying to believe in myself. This is me having to die to myself. Write that phrase down, die to self. You want a resolution? Make that number one this year. Someone says, what are your resolutions? Die to myself. Can I get an amen? You are the problem. I am the problem. And all I know is that Jesus says this, die to yourself. Die to yourself. If, if, if we only, if we left with this point, we'd be like, okay, let me give you the second point. It kind of balances it. Grace teaches us to rejoice. Grace has opened our eyes to the beauty of, of Jesus. Grace has opened our eyes to an accepting God. Grace is, is realizing that God knows everything about us and still chooses to love us. Grace is now this, this, this mechanism that causes us to realize we're chosen by God. We're called by God. Now I can live a life pleasing to God with his help. You can't do it without him. And because of what he has done for me, I rejoice in now living for him no matter what it takes. Can I tell you, a, a walk in holiness and godliness and purity is, is a difficult walk. But, but it's a joyous labor. 
it's kind of like a, a wedding day. I was married 32 years ago. So it's February, 32 years for Lori and I. I know it qualifies her for sainthood at this point, but let's not, get, let's not get carried away. 32 years. Here's what I know. Six months before our wedding day, I asked her to marry me. And I'll tell you, all of a sudden, she went into, as brides do, bride mode. Where it was like, all of a sudden, as soon as I proposed, she whips out the, the scrapbook and the vision board. And she's had all the contacts, right? Cake and bakers and this and that, right? And, and there was not a day that didn't go by where she was not focused on that wedding day. February 15th, 1992. And she was, she was like, okay, I got to go pick the dress. I got to make sure the dress is perfect. I got to make sure I'm, I'm the right way. I got to go make sure my, my lingerie is all that. I got to make sure my bridal party is ready. I got to make sure my girls are ready. I got to make sure I have all the, the attendance gifts. I need to make sure this. And it, every single day, it was like, duh, duh, duh. and then finally that day arrives, right? Everything that she had been living for and, and looking forward to, everything she had been anticipating and excited about, right? All of a sudden, it happened, right? All the continuous focus on that special day, right, where we're in this Baptist church in Scottsdale. And then there is 22-year-old Scott Morgan, Morgan all, all pockmarked and greasy and young and stupid, standing here with my, my guys. And I'm right there at the front of the church, and I'm looking down this very long aisle, and there are the two double doors that as I hear the music playing, I go, I know those doors are going to open up, and I'm not even ready to see what's on the other side. Those doors open up, and you think the Shekinah glory of the Lord showed up at that moment, right? There's this light, and there is Lori with her dad, and I just start blubbering, and I just start crying, and I'm starting weeping. I'm sobbing. There's not enough Kleenexes to take care of what's coming out of this face of mine, right? And I'm so excited. I'm like, everything we did. And then she comes down, right? And people are crying. And, and, and it was the most momentous, joyous event ever in my life. Outside of me being saved by God in Christ Jesus was the day I got to see my bride come forth down that aisle and say, I want to spend forever with you. And as a pastor, I have officiated hundreds of weddings, and I have never met a bride who treated that day horribly. <laughs> I've never met a bride who's just like, yeah, I'll figure out what I'm going to wear the day of. Never! Every bride makes sure, down to the smallest of details, everything is perfect. Because as she has been engaged and promised, now she's living in light of that consummation day that day of culmination, that day of the wedding ceremony. And I stand front and center and watch the blubbering guys and the blubbering girls and the blubbering family, right, who are there because of joy and excitement because they're seeing something happen that these two people have spent their li lives preparing for. How much different is it for us, ladies and gentlemen, as the bride of Christ, as our bridegroom is yet to come and consummate the wedding relationship? He's saying, bride, prepare yourselves. How are you doing with that? Are you thinking every day, like, how am I doing? Are my, are my clothes wrinkle-free? Is the food ready to go? Are my, are my wicks on my lamp trimmed appropriately? <laughs> are the lights on in my house? Is the master's meal ready, right? All the things we see in the Bible, we need to adorn ourselves and ready ourselves because the wedding is going to happen, and it is going to be the most amazing party of all. But the question is, are you ready for it? Are you just treating the wedding like, yeah, he'll come when he wants to come. I'm, I'm just over here binge-watching whatever. The latest show on, you know, eating gluten or not eating gluten or whatever it is you watch. You know what I'm saying? It's like we busy ourselves with things other than the fact that you're getting married. You've been engaged by the Holy Spirit. He's given you the promise ring. This is what Ephesians chapter 1 says. And he's going to come through on that promise and say, the wedding's coming. I'm not going to tell you when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And when it happens, it's going to be a party. Are you ready for the party? Ladies and gentlemen. Let us, the bride, continually adorn ourselves and make ourselves the most beautiful bride we can possibly be. I need to do that as an individual. We need to do this as a community. He's coming back. And I don't want us to be ashamed at his arrival. I want us to be eagerly awaiting it and excited about it. What a feast it's going to be. Grace. So grace teaches us to rejoice. He's coming. How many parables did Jesus tell you? Hey, I'm leaving you with responsibilities. I'm leaving you with work. I'm leaving you to, to walk in holiness because when I come back, I'm going to bring you to myself and we're going to be we're going to be married forever. That's why they call it the marriage supper of the Lamb. The day when he brings his bride to himself. 
Third point, we'll hit this one real quick, and then we'll finish with some application. Grace encourages us to remember. This is what I'm trying to do now. This is why I'm trying to help us focus on not this plane of existence. Think about eternity. Here's what I know for sure. You're all going to die. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to die. But don't do it in a, like a weird serial killer kind of way. <laughs> We're all going to die. <laughs> yeah. Don't look at the unmarked van in front of your house tonight. <laughs> You're going to die, right? One day we're going to wake up. We're going to take our last breath here and our first breath in eternity. We need to remember. And, and I think as, as, a, as a pastor, as your pastor, I need to keep that hope somewhat being built up within you. Um, our hope is tethered to him who is coming again. Our hope is we have a forerunner. Uh, author and perfecter of our faith, who is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says that we are somehow present even right now with him, but he's coming back. And the, we need to remember that. Just like he left, he's coming back the same way. I was reminded of a story of Florence Chadwick, this one woman uh, several years ago, who uh, she stepped off the island of Catalina off the coast of California because she was going to swim from Catalina Island to California coast. She had already done the English Channel both, both directions. So this woman steps into this water. Now, this time of year is foggy. Water was cold. She set off to, to swim. And uh, she could hardly see the boats around her that were accompanying her. On one of the boats was her own mom. She swam. She swam. She swam 15 hours. She eventually had enough. She couldn't take it anymore. She begged to be taken out of the water on board one of the boats. She even cried out to her mother who was in one of the boats. said, Mom, I'm done. Please get me out of here. And her mother told her that she was so very, very close to the shore and to keep going. Keep swimming, babe. You got this. Finally, she, she tapped out. She was physically, mentally, emotionally exhausted. She stopped swimming. She had to be drawn up out of the water. It wasn't until she got into the boat that she discovered that the shore was less than a half mile away. And in a post-interview, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. How true that is. We, we get foggy, don't we, in, in thinking about eternity? And if we can only keep our spiritual vision on the shore, we, we could keep doing this. I almost, I almost feel like there's great theology in, in the character of Dory from Finding Nemo. Can I get an amen on Dory? Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Come on. Great character or greatest character? Like, I'm your Dory today. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Like, church, we got this. We can, we can do this. We can continue to be the men and women God's called us to be. We, we need to keep talking about his return. We need to keep hoping in his return. We need to keep praying for his return. He wants us to trim our lamps. He wants us to prepare the house. He wants us to ready his favorite meal because he's coming back. And I'm here to say, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. So, so last point, hope blessed. So it's all going to come to completion one day, right? He's coming back. Verse 13, Titus says this is why we look forward to our blessed hope. That blessed hope is Christ himself. And I'm going to tell you right now, we need not fear. You know why we don't fear Jesus coming back? Because if your sins have been forgiven and you're living a godly life, you're ready. You're ready. There is no dread over thinking about Jesus coming back. None of this bumper sticker theology like, Jesus is coming back, look busy. Like, no, that's bad theology. That's bad theology, right? He's going to come and he's going to bring joy and he's going to bring richness and he's going to bring peace. He's going to bring reward, perfection, sinlessness, glory. Remember I told you we're free from the penalty of sin? We're also free now from the power of sin. One day we'll be free from the presence of sin. See, grace redeems, grace reforms, grace rewards. Five things, close this out, application. How can we prepare our hearts in anticipation for the second coming of Christ? Because it could happen at any moment. There's churches, and I've heard this, um, where the pastor would say to the church at the end of the service, Maranatha, which means Lord Jesus come. And the church responds, and it could be today. Maranatha, church. Well, seven of you got that. Good job. You're paying attention. Excellent job. Maranatha, church. 
Wouldn't that be great? Like on the streets, we see each other, and we're like, Maranatha, and it could be today, like our secret little code language. But isn't it true? Maranatha. It could be today. So how do we, how do we prepare our hearts for this? Three, four, five things. Number one, spiritual alertness. Continue to cultivate a life of godliness and holiness and purity. Again, we have a call by our master and our king and our Lord and our savior to walk in purity, to walk in holiness, to walk in godliness. And here's one thing I know about holiness is that the more you grow in holiness, the more you grow in hopefulness. When we dull ourselves in pursuing godliness, hopefulness fades. Can I encourage you? Pursue holiness. Remain spiritually aware. Become more and more like Christ. The issue is not that you can't. The issue oftentimes as believers is that we won't. We give allegiance to other things. Make Jesus the number one priority. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If he was to come back today, would you say you're ready to go? Think about it. Today may be your last chance to repent. Today may be your last chance to forgive. It may be your last chance to share the gospel. Right? Be sober-minded. Right? Here's, here we are, New Year's Eve. Right? Don't be filled with distilled spirits. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen, church? This is what we're called to do. Right? There's nothing wrong maybe having a, a libation. Right? Like, okay, whatever. But here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Make sure your hearts and your minds are sharp in their thinking that nothing dulls you to the things of God. Number two, missional eagerness. That we are a church that says, we understand that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Here I am, Lord, send me. That we are a people who understand that we haven't been saved just to enjoy it ourselves. We have been saved to be a living testimony of the, to those around us. We live in a world that is dying without Christ. They are lost. They are hopeless. They're discouraged. They're depressed. They're looking for hope in all the wrong things. A lot of hope sows. There's not a hope sure. And I pray that we're living such godly lives that perhaps we're giving them an occasion to ask us, tell us about the hope that's in you. Isn't that 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15? As you sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, the world's going to say, tell us about the hope that's in you, and you're going to be able to tell them with gentleness and respect. Don't be a jerk for Jesus. <laughs> right? They're going to ask you, your marriage goes through troubles, but yet you seem optimistic. Tell me why that is. You just you lost your job, and you seem encouraged in that. <laughs> tell me how you're doing this right? You're, you have a terminal illness or someone in your family is suffering from some sort of sickness and you seem optimistic. Tell me where that comes from. Can I just tell you, as, as we're present as a coffee house here in Chandler and, and beyond, you know, we've been here 13 years and people all around the valley know us. It's, it's, it feels weird. You're almost like a celebrity. You're like, oh yeah, we own so oh, You own Sozo? We love Sozo. We've been on this like, okay, that's cool. But you know what makes me more excited is when someone who comes in who was First, a customer who has turned into a friend and says, can I ask you to pray for my family? I can't tell you how many conversations I've had over the past couple weeks. One woman in particular whose son's got this terminal illness. He's 22 years old. She orders her extra hot 2% decaf latte. I mean, no judgment, but um, she orders her drink and then she, with tears in her eyes says, can I ask you to pray for my family? And I come around the bar and she gives me a hug. I said, you bet. And not only do I want to pray for her family and I want to pray for her son, I want her to come to know Jesus. And I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who are, they're looking for these outposts that, that pedal in hope. They pedal in grace. They pedal in love. Can you be merchants of those things and not be merchants in all the stuff that the world thinks is important? Your neighbors are dying because they don't have Jesus. And you may be the only Jesus they have in their lives. Do you sense the urgency in that? Do you sense the urgency to be salt and to be light? To love those who are going into a crisis eternity? And it could be today. Oh. Relational healthiness, number three. Can I just, just write the word forgiveness next to this? 
Some of you have relationships that are in horrible shape. And this has nothing with you being right or them being right. This has to do with forgiveness. And, and I can't tell you how many times I have been by the bedside of someone about ready to die who has unforgiveness between them and a loved one. And I'm there trying to broker reconciliation. One instance in particular, several years ago, I'm with a daughter and a mother who have years and years of bitterness and hostility with one another. And they're both crying. And be- literally, minutes before the mom takes her last breath here and enters eternity, they extend forgiveness to one another. They apologize to one another. Reconciliation happens. But it shouldn't wait until the hospital room. Some of you have business to tend to today. Tim Keller says this. He says, believing in the return of Jesus gives us the power to forgive. When someone wrongs us, we want justice. We run to the judgment seat of the world, hop on it, and help God mete out his due. But here's the problem. We weren't meant for that seat. It's too big for us. Here's one thing I know about the return of Christ. He will make every wrong right. He will vindicate. Stop looking for justice and start doling out forgiveness. You will never be wrong in the eyes of God when you, who have been forgiven, are a forgiving person. So, missional eagerness. Pray for the people in your life that don't know Christ. Relational healthiness, pray for the people you need to be reconciled to today. Matthew says, how dare you come to the altar and worship God when you know there's someone who has an issue with you. Leave your altar, go get reconciled, come back, worship God. It's hard. But the gospel demands it. If you've been forgiven, you will forgive much. Point number four is this, experiential hopefulness. I'm really stretching on these last couple ones. Sorry, guys. But what this means is that there's hope in our suffering. All I know is 2 Corinthians gives us a powerful word from Paul. He says in chapter 4, verse 16 and 18, do not, we do not lose heart. Why? Because we realize the outer self is wasting away, but the inner self is being renewed day by day. And here's the key. For this momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, right? We do not look at the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Here's what this says. It says, my momentary light troubles are nothing compared to what's, what's about ready to be revealed in glory, which means the pains I go through. Can I just tell you, this morning I woke up, I go downstairs, there's a leak coming from our upstairs bathroom. I've got a leak happening right now. We have the water shut off to our house. My kids are taking me pictures like, Dad, look, the ceiling fan's falling out of the roof. Look, Dad, the the, the paint's chipping away. And I'm sitting there going, great, I don't need to hear about this right now. (laughs) So Pastor Scott's got a leak in his house that right now, it's being being unattended to. Two days ago, I, I ran over a broken tool in the road, heard the loudest pop on my wife's car, destroyed a brand new tire, pulled over, realized her car doesn't have a spare in it. Good times to be had. Here's what I do know. I haven't lost hope. These are first world problems. Amen? There's coming a home for us one day where there will be no more pipes leaking. Can I get an amen from God's people? We will go to a place one day where there will be no more flat tires. Amen? And you won't even need a spare. Hallelujah! These momentary light afflictions are nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory. My bridegroom is coming back for his bride, and I can't wait for that day. And even though right now I may be walking through the valley of the shadow of death, as leaky as it is, I will fear no evil. For my God is with me and will never leave me. There's our hope. Right? Perspective. Last point is this. Material aloofness. I told you I was stretching right now. I love the word aloofness. You know what it means? It means I'm continually detaching myself from something. Here's what Jesus encourages. Stop loving this world. Learn to travel light because this world's not your home. You're, you're passing through. Here's what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11. It says that the men and women of faith 
really live for a different kind of homeland. Hebrews 11, write this passage down, look at it later. Look at what it says here. I love this. So there ought to be in us this, this desire to travel light, this, this lack of attaching myself to the worldliness of the world. Because the more you less love the world and the more you love God, the spirit within you longs for that return of Christ to come. Nothing dulls your heart more than just attaching yourself to the things that the world values. It's all going to fade away. Right? Jesus says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not on earth. Why? On earth, things rust. Moths eat away. Thieves break in and steal. Why would you do that? It's horrible investment. Look what Hebrews says. The, all these men and, women, men and women died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. When you are in Christ, there's no pushing the plow and looking back. You only move forward, right? But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Look what it says. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and God has prepared for them a city. Can I couple that with Philippians chapter 3, verse 20? Your citizenship is in heaven, not on earth. Ladies and gentlemen, this world is not your home. You're just passing through. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Long for his arrival. Christ has promised reward for those who want him to come back today. And if it doesn't happen today, let's hope tomorrow. Maranatha! And it could be today! Second Timothy, let me tell you why there's a reward. Paul closes with this, and we'll close with this. Very familiar passage, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now we stop right there and we go, man, that's a great t-shirt. Let's put that on our hats. Let's you know, put on bumper stickers, whatever, right? We fail to continue on and see what it says next. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Can I tell you, there is a reward called the crown of righteousness that is not given to every believer. Because not every believer loves his appearing. Will you be the one that receives the crown of righteousness? Will you be the one that has been preparing your heart today, living in light of the fact that he could come back at any moment? Are you ready? Are you excited? Are you eager? Are you anticipatory? I pray so. Maranatha Church. And it could be today. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for your bride. Thank you for these men and women who are here, who have joined together in song and now have joined together in hearing your truth. May your spirit work in all of our hearts and our minds in this room. May you bring us to a place of, of truly understanding the gospel message. Perhaps there are some that are here today who have yet to know Christ as Savior and Lord, and today's the day of salvation for them. We, we praise you for that work, Father. For those of us who have, may have grown uh, lethargic in our, in our spiritual thinking and our spiritual affections. Perhaps we've grown a bit apathetic. Perhaps today your spirit has excited something within us that we understand the importance of honoring you in our lives because of what we have received as far as this beautiful salvation. Help us to live lives in a manner worthy of our calling in Christ. And as we, and as we seek godliness, as we seek holiness, oh, Father, continue to keep our eyes heavenward. Continue to keep us with, with necks craned out, excited that it could be today that your son arrives and consummates the marriage union between himself and his bride. And until that day, may we be a prepared body. May we be a, a pure bride. May we be men and women who walk in godliness and holiness. Lord, it, thank you for the power to live this way. Thank you for the, the affections to desire these things, Lord. We want to glorify you. Thank you for loving us. Help us to finish the year well and perhaps prepare for a new year where we get to once again live for your glory and your honor. And all this is possible because of what Jesus has done for us. Thank you, Father, for loving us first. 
so that now we could love you. Empower us, guide our steps, be honored in all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace forever and ever. Amen. Maranatha!